You are listening to Be Amplified, the podcast with Brian Thais, episode number three. Hey, Amplifiers, welcome to Be Amplified, the podcast. My name is Thais. And I'm Bree Seeley. We are the co-founders of the Amplify Collective, a movement aimed at radically disrupting how purpose-driven women connect and operate in the world. Because we believe it's not just what you do, but who you are that matters. Each week, join us for messages and interviews that will leave you feeling amplified and ready to change the world. Let's do this. I love today's topic. We're going to dive into transitions. And we have an amazing guest, Jenny Fennig, who's going to be sharing her insights on transitions and living a life that you're really proud of. But before we bring her on, Brie, let's dive in. Let's talk about this thing. And more specifically, why it is that it feels like we're always in a state of transition. Always. I feel like that has just been my life for the past, like, I don't know, Three plus, well, let's be honest, more like 10 years. Okay, so tell us, Brie, what is the biggest transition you've gone through in your life? I mean, there's so many. I think the most recent one that I could really speak to is is moving to L.A. And no I know, way, that's my one. <laughs> I know you have this, a similar story, but like for me, you know, L.A. was the first place I've ever moved that I've actively chosen. Every other place that I've moved has been circumstantial. You know, I moved to, to Italy, but because I I could go to school there and get out of where I was living. You know, I moved near Seattle because I could get a job there ha- or had a job there and could get out of where I was living. And so I think LA is like a really poignant transition for me because I actively chose it. Oh, I love that. I mean, you know, I can also talk about my move to LA, but first I want to dive into yours was it a hard transition for you? Was it kind of easy? What makes it the biggest transition? So I am a baby step transitioner. I definitely (laughs) am like a dip my toe in the water kind of person. I've never been like a full on, you know, uh, what's it called? Cannonball in the pool kind of girl. I definitely like take my time. So it was at a point where I knew that I was unhappy. I was really super depressed. I hated my job. I was living alone and just super isolated. And I woke up one day and knew I needed to make a change. And so I gave myself nine months. Mm. I said by March 20th, so spring's equinox of 2013, I will live in a different place. All right. Can we pause right there? Because I think that's a pretty awesome uh, thing for our listeners to take away, which is if you are in a place where you are not happy, let's say you're in a relationship or at a job that you really want to shift from, one of the best ways that I've seen energetically is to set a move date. Even if it's just on your calendar five months out, today I will quit my job. It inspires you to start taking the actions necessary for you to take the move. Totally, because by that point, you know, I was like, all right, well, I have nine months. So first step is I need to figure out where the hell I'm moving. (laughs) Right? And that would be important. Yeah. So, you know, I made my list of like 10 different cities and of course whittled it down by to... What 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 was on your list? I mean, it was like Chicago, Phoenix, Portland. I was living between Portland and Seattle. So I was like, well, I could just move to Portland or I could just move to Seattle and not be like, you know, in the middle of nowhere anymore. Um, Of course, New York, L.A. And, you know, by the time that August hit that year, I'd whittled it down to New York and L.A. And I kind of kind of was a no brainer for me growing up in Minnesota. I would I will not do another winter. So I was like, (laughs) all right, well, New York is out. I'd been to L.A. really once in my adult life and hated it. And so I started coming here and I started having meetings here in the fashion industry. I started building relationships with people. I started really integrating myself and getting people to know me. I even got an L.A. number on Google Voice. Okay, again, I think this is so good because I did the same thing. So when I was transitioning to move to L.A., I switched all my social media handles to say I lived in L.A. Like six months before I even made the moves. I started making friends here. I hired my my first coach that was L.A. based. I lived as if I were already there. I would talk to my boyfriend Mark you know as if I was already living with him and I was just on vacation so I think that's so cool that we did something similar yeah and I mean really setting intentions it's it's and the more that you put it out there in the world the more you're then held accountable oh yeah 
you can't not move now. Yeah, it's on social have, media. <laughs> it, it says you live in LA, like you have to move to LA. Yeah. And so, you know, I had really, so I came here in August. I came here again in October. I came again in November um, and then let the holidays pass. And then my mom actually came to visit me in January. And, you know, I'm the oldest child and I'm mom's little girl. And she really voiced her concerns about how worried she was about me moving to LA. And uh, I just was so upset about maybe this isn't the move for me. Like mm. I, I was supposed to move in, you know, less than a month. And I was like, maybe this is the universe telling me that I'm not supposed to move. And oh, like, I, I what am if- so excited to dissect into that because I think we all have some sign that comes up in our lives that we get really worried is the sign from the universe against it. So we're going to, we're going to get back into that in a minute, but keep yeah. going. So luckily for me, my sister was down here and and she was um, doing a choir tour and I'd never seen her sing before. And so I'd already booked a ticket down here. So my mom had come and I was having this whole crisis, this whole, you know, dark night of the soul thing where I was like, ah, I can't move to L.A. I'm not not that girl. I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. <laughs> Maybe I'll just stay in, in Seattle. And I came down here and, and saw my sister and hung out with her. And at the during that trip, I found my roommate and I found my office mates and I had some business meetings and like everything flowed and gelled so well. And it was so easy that I was like, all right, this is the sign. Like this is the sign telling me that I'm supposed to be here and I cannot stay in the smallness that I've been in. Like it's really my time to take life by the horns and like really expand into this greatness that I've always wanted in my life. I'd always wanted to live in a big city and uh, it was my time. Oh, I love that. I mean, and I think one of the dangers of being so spiritually aware is oftentimes we layer our perception of life onto life. It's it's kind of like the quote, um, God is created in our image, which is it's our perception of life that determines our life. So if we are scared and we are terrified of a decision, we are going to look for evidence to support our fear like a ninja. I mean, we're going to look for any opportunity as the opportunity to say, ah, I see, this is a sign. I'm not supposed to be doing this. And that's why I tell my clients, you know, just be careful because if you are scared and we can all have fears and we're totally allowed to have them, but if you're scared enough that you are now looking for signs to validate your fear, and by the way, people are a great sign. They are the best mirror for our fears. If you have a fear, I bet you, your significant other, your family, they're probably all reflecting that back at you as their own fear. And so when you have a big transition coming up, just know that the fearful part of you is going to be looking for these signs. Do not believe it because you are literally putting your power away. You're saying to these obscure signs, you have total power over me. And really what you're saying is, dear fear, yes, please take the steering wheel. Please run my life because I'm terrified. And that's simply not a way to lead an amplified life. Yeah. So let's talk about taking risks, Thais. Tell us about uh, about your, how do you take risks? What are you, like, what's the process for you? What does that look like? Well, I'm more of a risk taker. And and my challenge is that too many times I dive right in without really thinking it through to make sure that I'm prepared to to handle this decision in the long run. So let's just take a pause. And I'd love (laughs) to point out that this is partially why Thais and I make such great business partners, because We definitely balance each other out in that respect. We're not both leapers. I'm definitely a toe person. She's definitely a full on, let's dive right in person. Oh yeah. And so it's so funny because both sides have their strengths and their weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses is that I just don't think long ahead. I'm like, you know what, whatever can come up, I'll just figure it out as it comes. And uh, yeah, it's great because I've led myself through some really amazing life experiences. And that means that sometimes I put myself in position where I probably could have avoided it had I thought long ahead. So I also moved to LA. I moved June of 2015. So it's been almost a year that I've been an LA resident. And um, I shared a little bit in our previous uh, podcast that, you know, I was in a full-time job that I didn't like. And I knew that I wanted to uh, be a spiritual teacher and grow my own business. And my boyfriend actually lived out here and we were doing the long distance for two years. And every time I came to visit him, 
yeah, I could feel, I could fall in love with uh, with LA. Like, yeah, I, I could get used to this weather. And you know, the more we deepened our relationship, the more I knew that he was the man I was supposed to be with. And uh, so I decided to do all of it at once, like rip the bandaid right off. I quit my job. I moved here. Uh, to go into my business full time, I went here, moved in with my partner. You know, we hadn't even lived together before. And I was like, nope, we're just going to do it all. I'm going to just do it all. And I think the hardest uh, transition for me really was the road trip. I mean, so I drove from Frederick, Maryland, right outside D.C. Uh, to California by myself. And that road trip was a hero's journey on its own. And I learned so much about what it looks like to be in transition and to really look at the risks and be in the middle and have a vision for what you want, but be terrified that it's not going to happen. And so that whole experience is, oh, it's, it was so life changing for me. But, you know, one of the things that I know for sure is that nothing comes, nothing brilliant comes in your comfort zone. So if you're not uncomfortable at least once a day, you're probably doing it wrong. So uh, are you willing to share how uncomfortable you were uh, when you got to, was it Colorado? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So <laughs> fun story. Uh, so across, I drove cross country and I stopped in Colorado for a week for my cousin's wedding and my family flew out there. Mark flew. So everyone was in Colorado for a week. And uh, my mom was actually supposed to take the second half of the trip with me. We were going to spend four or five days in Utah and Arizona, and it was just going to be a beautiful uh, experience, mother-daughter experience. And uh, she got a cold. She got sick. And she was also going through some dietary issues, and she was just not feeling well. And so she decided, nope, I'm not coming. I'm so sorry. I love you. You got this. Go. You know, pushing the chick off the, the uh, nest. And so my next resource was Mark, you know, my boyfriend. So I asked him to come along. Hey, babe, you know, you want to drive with me for four days, like a romantic getaway before we move in together? And he was also unavailable. He also had plans with his grandfather and that whole family thing. So I was alone. And I tell you what, I felt so abandoned in that moment. I felt so vulnerable, so scared. And for the first time in the decision, I realized I'm really, really alone in this. And not just, not alone, like physically, like, of course, I have you know, the universe supporting me, but physically, like, I really have to say yes to my life and not really, of course, you can have a support system, but just know that they're not going to live your life for you. You have to live your life. And this decision that I've made means I have to now be in it and I have to say yes to it fully for myself and not just because of the people around me. So I, I did the trip and I shortened it up. I only did it in two days instead of the four and I drove and uh, for me, that was one of the biggest breakthroughs in terms of the hero's journey, which is you're always going to have to fight a dragon. It's always going to be inside yourself. And every time you do, something beautiful happens at the other end. And for me, it was moving here. And I remember pulling into downtown L.A. because that's where Mark lived at the time and uh, calling him and being like, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. And I think that was a, one of the most magical moments in our relationship. I also don't think I'll ever forget the day that I pulled in to LA. Mm. I had, you know, my car packed. I had bo both kitties in the car with me. One was in a carrier, one was roaming free and pulled up and got to like, luckily we had an apartment and got to the apartment and my roommate and I at the time went and got Thai food that night. And, um, yeah, it was, it's kind of amazing how those poignant moments just really, um, can Stand stay out. with you yeah. for so long. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever forget the, you know, not that it's the end of the journey, but it's the end of a journey yeah. and really, yeah, I mean, it's just such a, a powerful moment to step back and realize everything that you've accomplished and where you've come. You know, for me, it was eight months of preparation and anxiety and excitement and all of that stuff. It's, so, And, you know, for us, the biggest transition we've experienced was a physical move. But for you, it could be a relationship. It could be really saying goodbye to an era and, and going out on your own. It could be a career move or it could be going into entrepreneurship. I mean, I think both Bree and I have experienced every level of transition. And I, oh, think, absolutely. I think what makes the physical move so powerful is that it's it's so physical. You can see it. It's tangible. That's what the word I was looking for. It's tangible. So we could see the, the transition by looking outside our window, really. Yeah. And, you know, Thais and I are both talking about a transition we've e each experienced, but 
you know, seven years ago, I left a relationship and that was a huge transition for me. Two years ago, or I guess a year ago, I shut down my fashion brand. Huge transition for me. You know, she and I are going through huge transitions right now with the Amplify Collective and launching it into a new membership-based um, business. And I mean, really, the the conversation of transitions just goes and goes and goes yeah. and goes. Like, I don't, I don't know if there's ever a day when any human being is not in transition. I mean, I think that's how we started this podcast and I think that's how we should end it. Just know that there is always an end to a transition and then there's always a new beginning. There's always a new transition, but just trust. I know that sometimes in the middle, it can look so messy and in the middle, it can look like you're not getting anywhere. And I love the book you squared by Prince Pr Price, Price Pritchett. And he says in the book, he's like, in the middle of surgery, the, the room looks a mess. It looks like someone died. In the middle of baking a pie, the kitchen looks like a mess. It looks like you're destroying everything. But that's the beauty. In the middle, it's going to be messy. And that's okay. When you take a leap across a puddle, don't focus in the middle. Focus on where you're going to land. Keep holding true vision of what you want your life to be like. And I feel like that is just such a perfect transition for who we got on our podcast today. Hi, Jenny. Welcome to Be Amplified. Hello, ladies. Super psyched to be here with you today. Us too. So for those of you who do not know Jenny yet, Jenny is a brand strategy coach, best-selling author, motivational speaker, and champion of gutsy women in business. She believes that women have the power to create their own economy through unleashing their unique gifts and believing in their value. Jenny launched her company in 2008 to empower women to reach more, make more, and play more. The unified mission of Jenny's courses, books, podcasts, speaking, and coach certification school is how to touch more lives with your message and cash in on your calling. I love it. Wow. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you get to hear your own bio being read. <laughs> oh, I know. So tell us, Jenny, what does it look like to you to live an amplified life? Wow. I really like that question. For me, it's it's showing up as me un unapologetically. This is me flying my freak flag, being comfortable with putting myself out there, speaking my truth, and taking exquisite care of myself as well. Uh, when we are called to serve, which I know the two of you are, I am, I'm sure a, a lot of your listeners are as well. We are called here for service. We are called here to make an impact. It's very easy to lose ourselves in the process, put everyone else's needs in front of ours and even forget who we truly are inside. And so to live an amplified life is, is that you are putting yourself and your needs right there at the top of the priority list and knowing that you're never alone on this quest. So cultivating a spiritual practice of your own understanding is crucial on that quest to be amplified and to have sustainable amplification. Mm. So for those of us that don't yet know you, what yeah. does that look like for, for you? Like, so tell us about your freak flag. How do you <laughs> show up authentically in every area of your life? Mm -hmm. I'm very expressive. I am a communicator. That is who I am at my core. I'm a Gemini. And uh, <laughs> yes, I, that's right. I know. That's right. Me and you, girl. And so, you know, our, our mantra is I communicate. Like I communicate, I communicate. If I'm not communicating, I'm like dying, right? You know, I'm dying inside. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm shriveling up and dying. So I am just a communicator. I am talking to my people. I am, uh, you know, on Facebook or some, Facebook is my favorite social media channel. So that's where I am. I'm talking to my people in the groups that I run. I'm doing Facebook live videos. I am out there just writing my truth through my offerings, through how I'm teaching, through how I'm showing up, through how I'm interacting with people at, you know, the grocery store, just being, being me and, and not worrying about what other people think or what, you know, what's this person gonna, um, gonna think about me if I say how I really feel or say my idea in a meeting that needs to be said, but no one else is saying it. So it's truly about being yourself and trusting that that is enough. That is enough. By you being yourself, by you wearing what you want to wear, having your hair the way you want to have it, um, you know, really dancing to the beat of your own drummer, like that 
is enough. And the more that you can do that, the more you will stand out, the more opportunities will come your way, the juicier your relationships will get. It's truly extraordinary. Oh, I love that. I think that that's so powerful. And the idea of authenticity, I think, Mm -hmm. is so over talked about, but no one really gets to the core of why it's so hard for us to be authentic, which I think really has to do with fearing people's judgment of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what does that look like for you? How did you overcome that obstacle, that fear of people judging you and you feeling not enough or you feeling Mm -hmm. like people weren't going to love and accept you for who you are? Mm -hmm. Well, that happens for us. I mean, we've been conditioned. We've been shown that we will be judged. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, that happened for me early Um, as a young girl. I remember even going as far back as fifth grade. I still have this memory. I think I talked about it. You know, I have a podcast too. And I I believe I talked about on one of my solo episodes. I'll do solo episodes as well as, um, you know, interview my guests. And I remembered back to this story when I was literally, I had just finished fifth grade and moved from Florida to, uh, I'm sorry, moved from Georgia to Florida. And, you know, this was pre-email, pre-cell phone, pre-texting, pre-any of that. We had writing letters, <laughs> like we had writing letters and putting them in the mail and you wait a few days until they get there. And I remember getting a letter in the mail from a friend of mine who, you know, we miss you so much, Jenny. I mean, I was devastated to, to move. Like I had built up this entire, you know, like life for myself. And I was quote, one of the popular girls, like even so far back as fifth grade, you know, and my friend was telling me how much she missed me and all the friends missed me. And except for this one particular girl who she, then proceeded to tell me about. And this one particular girl was basically just, as she said to my friend, was using me to advance her social cred. And it's just fifth grade. I was like 11 years old, you know, it was happening as early as that, where yes, you're going to be judged. You're going to be used. This is going to happen. And, and for women, especially, we can be really brutal with each other. And we're taught this, you know, if you were to look at the cover of these tabloid magazines or watch any reality show, if a young girl is watching that, she thinks that's how you're supposed to behave. You know, like that's what the older girls do. So I'm going to model that. So yeah, we're going to be judged. We're going to be criticized. We're going to be, um, you know, stabbed in the back. And it's, it's, you know, it's a rite of passage and you get stronger on your quest to simply stand firm in who you are and to trust that those people who you are aligned with would not do that to you. And the more that you can just express what's coming through you, I believe that we're, you know, we're vehicles and vessels for, for goodness and truth. And those of us who have said yes to this path of leadership, we know that we have a message that we came here to share. So the more that we can share that, the more that we can say, I am willing to speak what is true for me to share this piece of wisdom that I believe, you know, we've had, you know, for several lifetimes. I believe in all of that. When we can say yes to it, um, in my case, when I made that decision to write my first book several years ago, that was one of the scariest endeavors of my life to write that because I wrote the book as uh, what I called memoir mixed with medicine. And the book is called Get Gutsy. The name of my podcast is Get Gutsy. I've just kind of ridden that message a very far away. It's like my magic carpet ride. And uh, making the decision to write that book was terrifying because I was going to be sharing stories in there that I hadn't really shared in quite that way. I was going very, very deep. I had shame that I had carried around for like 20 years. Uh, A lot of it related to the death of my sister. She passed away from cancer when I was a teenager and I couldn't process that. And so I did things to numb that whole experience. And I knew that when I, I want this book had to come through me, these, these truths that I learned, these lessons that I learned from some really hard experiences, some really beautiful experiences, they weren't just fluke experiences in my life. They happened to me. They happened through me because I am supposed to tell people about this stuff. Mm. You know, you and I talked about that, Thais, on your uh, episode on my podcast, the, the, the heroine's journey, the hero's journey, that we have these things that happen to us so that we can then share with our people, with our tribe. So, you know, that's how you step into your leadership. That is how you get, um, unafraid of the fear like you just don't let the fear rule you anymore because you get out there and you do the thing and you know that you know even if you get a critic and you will you know if you write a book you will have people who have negative reviews about your book like it is guaranteed absolutely guaranteed 
And you will have the vast majority who freaking rave about it, who say that it helped them so much and it changed their life and thank you, thank you. And, you know, honestly, you can't attach to the good or the bad. You simply have to keep doing your work, keep sharing your truth. That is our responsibility as leaders here on this on this quest. So for those that are listening today that want to say yes to their message and they Mm -hmm. want to embrace that leadership within them, Mm -hmm. but they don't know where to start, what Mm -hmm. do you recommend for like a first step for someone Mm -hmm. that's ready to take that, that path? Yeah, that's a really good question. You have to be willing to go inward and get quiet. And for many, that is scary. (laughs) (laughs) Like, But what am I going to hear? What's going to happen when I turn off the TV and stop needing all of these opinions from people and I actually listen to my own voice, my own inner voice, because maybe what you're going to hear is that it's time to make a change. It's time to move. It's time to leave a relationship or get into a relationship or quit your job or start a business or write your book or launch your podcast or, you know, whatever, have a baby. So uh, that was where I began. It was by getting quiet and going inward. And I resisted it for a very, very long time. So I understand why people do it. And it will change everything. So getting quiet. Meditation. I love guided visualization. Um, There's a great app, Insight Timer. Um, It's a free app. And you can listen to guided meditations on there. You can listen. You can just set the timer for 10 minutes and just see what happens. You know? (laughs) See what happens. And then I'm also a fan of creating a vision. Creating a vision. Because the vision allows you to see where you're called to go next and who you're called to hang with and who you're called to serve and what message you're here to share. And it really does help you carve out kind of your unique, um, your brand and this, this beautiful, uh, voice that you have, you alone, no one else has the exact same message or voice as you. So I'm a big fan of vision boards. I'm going to be sharing a tool with, uh, with your listeners during this episode that they can get their hands on. You know, I started doing vision boards several years ago, uh, when I was in a funk, when I didn't know what the heck, you know, I was just like, how did I get here? I don't, I don't want to be here anymore. I used to work, at, uh, live and work in New York City, um, these big kind of corporate jobs. And it was my dream. What I thought was my dream. And and I realized it was not my dream. I, my path was something very, very different. And I had to excavate myself from a world that I thought I'd always be in and figure out what world I was actually meant to be in because I, I wasn't even clear on that at that point. I didn't know entrepreneurship. I didn't know coaching. I didn't know online marketing or podcast or books or any of it. But I started just really creating my vision and trusting that, putting things up there and then not worrying that like, well, how's that ever going to happen or that's crazy or just, you know, creating that whole, creating a vision board, you know, for, for every single listener, that is such an epic act. It's not just an arts and crafts project. (laughs) It is truly pulling out your dream from inside of you. And I, I equate it to submitting your order to the universe. It's like you're sitting down at this uh, restaurant and it's like, imagine that you're sitting down at the restaurant. For those of you listening who are like, I'm not living this dream life. I'm, I don't even know really what I want yet. Well, I kind of do, but I'm scared to say it because what if I don't get it? Or what if people laugh at me or tell me I'm ridiculous? Well, imagine that you're sitting at this restaurant and the waiter or a waitress comes over to you and says, great to have you here. Uh, what can I get for you? What would you like to order? And you say, oh, I'm not sure. Just bring me anything. Um, I'm, you know, I'm easy. And then they bring you something that you hate. You don't eat it. You know, maybe you're a vegetarian and they bring you a filet mignon or something. And, you know, that's what it is. You have to be willing to submit your order to the universe. And so, you know, as we're having this, this conversation right now, I have two vision boards in my space and I, I have one in front of me and one behind me. And so I'm always looking at one. And when I do my, you know, my videos or my coaching calls with with my uh, students and clients, the one behind me is always visible to them. And so I'm seeing it then and they're seeing it for me. So it's, you know, I practice this very much so. So quick question. Do you remember any of the things that were on that first vision board that really helped you move from that place to the next? Mm, Mm. Yes. I like that a lot. Okay. So, um, I've had several vision boards over the years. One that is, that comes to mind very vividly for me right now. I I talk about it in my book, 
I think it's actually the first chapter in the book. Um, when my husband and I, we were at that point married for five years. It was our five-year wedding anniversary. And I had already quit my, my corporate life and moved into entrepreneurship, but my business looked very, very different then. Um, nothing like it does now, other than I was coaching women. <laughs> um, but we had one son at the time. And honestly, ladies, I, for years, was finished living in New York City but I was still living in New York city. I had done it. It was like, I had graduated from that dream, but I did not know where to go next. And neither did my husband. And we looked at so many pieces of real estate in New York city, in Brooklyn, in Jersey, in Westchester, in Connecticut. I mean, everywhere. I was exhausted. I was like, I don't, I'll just go anywhere. Trust me, just give me another place. Like, can I go somewhere, please? And we just couldn't agree on anything. Just wasn't, wasn't working. And me being the Gemini, Thais, you can relate. I was, you know, we can dive in pretty quickly. We're like, woo, let's do it. You know? Yep. <laughs> and my husband is a Libra. He balances uh. everything. <laughs> We're a very good match, but sometimes he drives me crazy about that. So we went to Kripalu, which is a wonderful, you know, personal growth, um, yoga, wellness retreat center here in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, which is now where I live. We went there for our five-year wedding anniversary for a couple's retreat. And as part of that retreat, we did vision boards. And on our vision board, it was like I literally had – I had – I put a couch on there that I didn't have at the time. Like I created this whole vision of just an expansive space, an expansive living space filled with light, filled with openness, a house. Like it was very obvious that it was a house. It wasn't this small apartment. We had a beautiful apartment in a high rise, you know, luxury building in New York. It was, you know, nothing to sneeze at, but I was just done, you know? And so it was just creating this, this beautiful vision for, um, for the sanctuary that I wanted for our home that was quiet, that was filled with nature. Um, I had more children on there. You know, it was just, I saw it. I saw it. And it was not um, even a week later that we got the download. We actually, I got, we got the download like one or two days later that we were supposed to be living in the Berkshires, which is where Kripali was located, which we had a connection there. We got married in the Berkshires. My in-laws had a vacation home here. So it wasn't just like, let's move to right outside of Kripalu. Um, But it became very clear that it was time for us to go. And the fears that we had about, I literally was afraid of who I would be if I, I, if I couldn't say I lived in New York City. I'm like, maybe I'm just not going to mean as much to the world because I don't live in New York City anymore. What would that mean for me? And um, I realized, you know, I thought I was going to be like a Stepford wife. I mean, really, I had all of these crazy fears. And uh, it became very clear. And a week later, you know, we made the decision. We're moving. Um, We put up the apartment. We got subletters for the apartment because our lease wasn't up yet. And a few years later, that that freaking couch on that vision board, I now own that couch. Wow. That's (laughs) awesome. I own the couch. And then another thing was I put a picture up of a a older boy holding a little girl's hand. My first, I had a, when I did that, I had one son. I eventually got pregnant, had a second son. I now have a daughter. Wow. Uh, She's, we're recording this in April. She's turning um, two this weekend. And so that girl, it was like, I knew that my girl was waiting for me. I knew she was looking for me and I was looking, I didn't know I was looking for her for that time. I saw her on the vision board. And so I I just knew like that is part of my path and, you know, becoming a parent and having children, it's amazing. And it's also scary. And our growth can, can feel scary. It can, because we, we go into this place. Well, who am I? How will this ever, who am I to have this? Could I handle it? I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to mess it up. But when we get clear with ourselves and get quiet and just, just go and have that fun experience of going through magazines and pulling things out. And it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. I love it. I love your story, Jenny. And I feel like it takes so much courage for you to do what you've done. And I know that that's why you're so passionate about teaching, you know, the gutsy and and the be bold. And I also know that transitions and going into transition is absolutely key to leading and living an amplified life. You cannot lead your best life from your best self if you're not willing to go transition yourself from the old to the new. So my question for you is what was that transition like? You were like shedding an old skin. What Mm -hmm. was that like for you? And what really helped you uh, beyond the vision, like a day to day that Mm -hmm. pulled you forward, even when everything you knew was behind Mm you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, you know, transition is really, really intense. Um, 
I, you know, I have birthed three babies and, and two of those babies came quote naturally. My middle guy was breached. So I had a C-section with him for the two where I birthed naturally transition, you know, for all of our listeners who have had babies, seven to 10 centimeters, when you dilate seven to 10 centimeters, you feel like you're dying. Oh my you're gosh. like, that's it. You know, like do not pass go. I changed my mind. I can't do this. <laughs> this is insane. And you really feel like it's impossible. Like you're just breaking from the inside. That is, that is how it feels. So I use that analogy a lot because that honestly is how transition can feel. It can just feel horrendously scary. Um, impossible. You want to turn back. (laughs) You want to go back to what, you know, the, the comfortable, even if you know, it's not right for you anymore. So you just have to know that, you know, that's, what it is. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong. It's just, that's what it is. Okay. And so that's where your spiritual practice comes into play. That is where you tap into faith. That is where you have prayer. That is where you uh, take exquisite care of yourself, you know, by exercising, moving your body, getting quiet, eating wonderful foods, um, fueling yourself with, you know, green juices, green smoothies, water, tea, like just really knowing that, especially during transition, you've got to, you, you got to be strong for sure, but you also need to hold yourself softly, you know? And so having supportive people in your life, um, you know, being very mindful about who you are connecting with during those transitions, you know, not if you're making a big move, like you're, you know, starting a business or, uh, you know, moving across the country to go be with your, your partner. Uh, and, and you know, you've got people in your life who are really nervous about that or could never do that themselves. Then you want to be really smart about, maybe not sharing so much of the detail with them because they're not going to be able to hold you through it. They're going to project their own stuff on you. You may start carrying that energy with you, start doubting your decisions, start just feeling like, you know, is this wrong? What am I doing? And, and so you got to be mindful of the company that you keep. You got to take exquisite care of yourself and just keep coming back to that spiritual practice. Know that you are being guided. You are being led. You are never alone. You will never be forsaken and trust that, you know, when you are coming from that place of honoring the calling that you have, honoring this, why, you know, why are you showing up in the world? Why do you do what you do? Why, 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 why you? And why this? And then, you know, just having that clear vision, you will be able to walk in faith. And I will tell you what is waiting for you on the other side of that transition. You can't even imagine it. It's extraordinary. It's, it's gold, it's treasure, it's growth. It's, it's everything that, that you want is waiting on the other side. Absolutely. I had a really similar experience when I took the leap to come to Los Angeles uh-huh. And I almost didn't do it. Like it uh-huh. was, you know, a few weeks beforehand and, and I had someone mirror to me the fears that they were having about me moving. Uh-huh. And I almost fell into it. I was so close. And luckily I had already pre-booked a trip to come here and start touring apartments uh-huh. um, and knew that everything was in line and that I was supported. But man, that last like little piece where you have to actually take that last step can be Mm -hmm. such a crucial one. And really, like you said, having those practices in place is so important. And I really love that you mentioned the spiritual practices because, you know, Tice and I both absolutely agree that it's, it is essential to have that kind of practice for Mm -hmm. all of us to lead a big and amplified life. So Mm -hmm. our, my question is, were you always spiritual? Um, if not, how did you develop your practice? Mm -hmm. Um, and then now that you have a practice, what's your favorite part of it? Mm, nice. Uh, no, I was not always spiritual. I, I didn't really know what that was growing up. I didn't, uh, my, my father is very religious and I, I don't believe that spirituality and religion are the same thing. Uh, but my father was quite Catholic, but when my parents divorced, we, um, I lived with my mom and we didn't go to church. My mom didn't really expose me to spirituality. She wasn't practicing like, you know, your thoughts become things. She didn't know about like Abraham Hicks or, you know, any, I didn't get that from really any of my parents, but my father was always a man of faith. And I, I, I knew that about him. I respected that in him because he had a very challenging upbringing. And I just, I saw that that gave him a lot of courage and strength. His 
his version of, of faith, right? His brand of faith. And although that, that wasn't the path that I was going to be on, I just kind of saw that in him. I'm like, okay. And when my sister, um, you know, I had a younger sister who passed away when I was a teenager and she was very religious. She believed in God. She talked about God. She went to church camp. She loved going to church camp. Like I went to church camp to like you know, hang out with the cute boys. Like I wasn't going to church. I went like once because my friend had me go with like her church. I was like, yeah, I'll go because there'd be like some boys that aren't at our school, you know, it'd be like new boys. And and my sister like went to church camp because she like really wanted to be there and was really into God. And and she got sick um, when she was very young. When she was 11, she got cancer. Wow. And yeah, and then she died when she was 12. And, you know, now being on so far, it's been 22 years since my sister Julie died her faith, her belief in God got her through that. Absolutely got her through that hell of, you know, being sick with cancer, radiation, brain surgery, chemotherapy, being on steroids, you know, all these drugs that just take away your quality of life. And it was her faith in God. I found her diary after she died where she wrote in there, I found God today, like 17 exclamation points, hearts, like, and I'm like reading this going, what is she talking about? What, like, what is that? How how did she find God? I I, I don't know what that means, but it was very, very meaningful for her. And I, um, the, pretty much the day that she died, she died. This happened on a Saturday. She technically died like on a Sunday morning in a, in in a hospital, but she asked for her last rites to be administered and she pulled her body up in bed and, and prayed. She put her hands together. She had no strength left in her body and she was able to do that. And I saw all of it not being able to really process it at the time as a 16-year-old going, WTF is happening? Like, what is what is this? I'm not prepared for this. I I don't know how to move through this. But it, it, it stuck with me. It stuck with me. And, you know, after that, ladies, I just, and I talk about it a lot in my book. That's why I had to write my book, because I needed to get that story out. I needed to get that story in particular out. And um, it took me many, many years of running, of going into what I call the, you know, uh, aholisms, like alcoholism, workaholism, social drugs, just like trying to keep up and be the best at everything and party, but yet be amazing at this and that and never let anybody down. And, and I finally just, it caught up with me in my New York City life where I just collapsed. I literally had like a, a, a panic attack um, in my office and, you know, right there on 42nd Street. And, um, and I just realized, like, I can't run anymore. I just cannot run anymore. I can't. I can't run from this. I can't run from the pain. I can't run from this voice because my inner voice, you know, we talked about getting quiet and getting still. The inner voice was saying to me, Jenny, stop, mm. stop. And I did. And once I committed to listening to that voice, I saw my sister everywhere. I saw my sister everywhere. I saw her everywhere. People just showing up and Julie, Julie, Julie. And I'm like, okay, because <laughs> her name was Julie. And it was there that I really started this love affair with um, getting quiet. And that became my spiritual practice. I started getting into yoga. I um, Yoga saved my life. It changed my life. I realized that, you know what? I don't want to go out and get trashed on a Friday night because actually I have this great yoga class that I go to on Saturday mornings now. And it's way better to be sober, to be sober and not hungover in that class. So I realized that my body was a temple and I started being super mindful about what I was putting in there, who I was hanging out with, who I was dating, what I was doing for work. So, um, and it was pretty much in the last like year, I'd have to say where I really got close with God, really got close, was comfortable even saying the word. Um, and, and to everyone listening, if you're not comfortable with that word, just put in another word because it's simply, you know, for me, God equals love. And I realize that I'm, I'm not alone and God is so right here with me guiding my steps and giving me that, that courage and that strength to truly walk in faith towards my destiny. So my practice is prayer, it's meditation, it's yoga, it's kindness to myself and to others. It's listening And it's spreading that message too. And knowing that those who are meant to hear it will be able to receive it. I love that kindness to yourself and others. I think that's something, especially to ourselves, that we can very easily overlook. Um, So I really love that you mentioned that. Like, Mm -hmm. Jenny, this was seriously so good. Like spirituality, transitions, Mm -hmm. visions. Like, thank you for being with us today. This was beautiful. 
My pleasure. Oh, I'm, I'm just here nodding my head and, and I'm just in such awe at your story and, and how you have experienced so much at a, such a young age. And, you know, I truly believe that it always happens, even if we can't possibly understand how it all happens for a divine reason. And I, I love your journey. I love your story. Tell us, for those of us that are listening, how can they find you? Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been awesome. Well, you know, we talked a lot about vision boards. So I wanted to give your listeners a gift. Woo! And I've created, Ray, we love gifts. It's uh, it's called the Gutsy Guide to Vision Boards. And it's basically a free guide I developed to empower you to visualize your gutsy dreams in business, life, the whole kit and caboodle, and submit your order to the universe. All right? Because love when it. we ask for what we want, then we are that much more likely to get it. So you can go to Gutsy Vision Board. Dot com. That's gutsyvisionboard.com. Enter your details and that will instantly land in your inbox. I'm also very active on social media. You can hit me up Facebook. Uh, that's my most, uh, that's the platform that I'm most uh, active on. I'm also on Instagram. So come and connect with me there. I'd love to hear, you know, your, your thoughts on, on this episode and just get to know everybody better. I love you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, for those of you listening, as usual, you can find us on Facebook at The Amplify Collective. You can also find us on Twitter at The Amplify Co. And, of course, if you love this episode, we would be super honored to hear your feedback on iTunes. These reviews absolutely mean the world to us, and it allows more people to see this podcast on their suggested features. And who knows, maybe someday we'll review, we'll read some of your reviews on air. <laughs> uh, and be sure to catch our next episode next week. We're really excited for the guests that we have coming on, so tune in for that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget, you have everything you need to lead an inspirational and badass life every day. So go be amplified.